welcome dear students to epg parshala i am dr k s nagaraja of deccan college pune teaching the course of historical linguistics in today's module we discuss one type of classification of languages called typological classification it is an important one as uh, uh, it has uh, stood ground though it appeared that uh, uh, it was secondary when the genetic classification became more important more uh, prestigious so now typological considerations have gained ground and uh, they are uh, used across languages for various purposes particularly to understand the extent of variation and identifying language universals this has become very useful so in this particular module we look at the development of typological classification as a model for languages linguists may look at a language from any point of view ranging between two extreme poles at one end each language is unique at the other all languages are the same both polar extremes deny the feasibility of typological classification although the universalist approach delineates natural language from other sign systems the problem is the same in all social and cultural sciences the phenomena we study never show up in pure form every such event occurs in the concrete form of particular historically conditioned cultures languages and so on individual men and communities do not dwell alone in incommensurate worlds of their unique experiences they communicate with each other in linguistics it has always been known that certain languages resemble each other more than certain others this study concentrates on comparing two or more languages to find out to what extent they are similar or different taking various morphological features into account because the attention here is solely on the linguistic features which are here types and so such a study is called typological study and when languages are classified on such a basis it is called typological classification the term typology has a number of different uses in linguistics typology is used to refer to the classification of structural types across languages the study of linguistic patterns or generalizations that hold across languages and a theoretical and methodological approach that contrasts with other linguistic theories these three definitions of typology correspond to the classification generalization and explanation of grammatical phenomena on a broad empirical base and so constitute the typological approach to the study of grammar in this module only the first namely the typological classification of languages is concerned a typological classification groups languages into types according to their structural characteristics to the typologies of the early 19th century especially frederick schlegel and his brother august wilhelm but also to some extent to wilhelm von humboldt who is credited with having launched this typological research program the division of language types into the ones given below was linked to different stages of development of the languages and language families in question the most famous typological classification which was frequently invoked in the 19th century in support of an evolutionary theory of language development 
was proposed by August Wilhelm Schlegel's tripartite classification of morphological types of 1818 may be diagram as below. Uh, the tripartite uh, classification proposed by August Wilhelm Schlegel was the first, uh, first one as it was in 1818. He thought that in a language, if every word has only one meaning as such, then such a language is a very simple one and there we have one-to-one -one correspondence, such a language can be called isolative language. Chinese, Vietnamese are supposed to be of this type. However, if a word has more than one meaning or more than one meaningful forms in a word, then there are two possibilities. One, if the forums are not only intact, but they maintain their identities, then it is called agglutination. That means uh, uh, various morphemes come together and uh, they, they, they occur in a word, they form a word, but e each morpheme has a function and it can be identified easily. So then it's called agglutination. Dravidian languages, uh, Turkish are supposed to be of this type. The third one, the third possibility where a word stands for more than one function or more than one meaning. Uh, that means there is a modification involved there, then we call it inflectional language. That means there the correspondence is, uh, is not one to one, uh, one to many, one word having more than one function. In fact, there also, there are two possibilities, how, how far inflectional, whether it is very strong or in a way weak. If it is a very strong one, then it is called synthetic, like for instance, Latin, Sanskrit, Greek belong to this type. Whereas uh, if you look at English, for instance, uh, the level of uh, inflection is somewhat less here. Uh, scholars use a word analytic to refer to this kind of language. So this way, this kind of tripartite classification was the first one and became the starting point. Of course, they tried to uh, interpret it in different ways. So it may be noted that inside this, uh, the inflectional language, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it could be synthetic or it could be analytic. And then in his comparative grammar of 1833, Franz Bob, Bob who had criticized Schlegel's uh, earlier scheme, uh, revised his own views, subscribed to a large extent to uh, A. W. Schlegel's framework, Wilhelm von Humboldt, to subscribe to A. W. Schlegel's scheme, though with the added claim that the structure of a particular language reflects the particular genius of a people, of a community. This connection between language typology and specific manner of perception on the part of the speakers was to lead to a line of research in the 19th century first synthesized by Hermann Steinthal during 1850-1890 and followed with modifications by Franz Nicholas Fink and others in the late 19th and the in the late 19th century and by Edward Sapir and others in the early 20th century, including among other things, the so-called Sapir-Urf hypothesis, which claims a connection to exist between the perception of the outside world by a given people, that is worldview, and the grammatical organization of their particular language. Essentially, two major lines of tradition in 19th century typology 
can be distinguished. The one initiated by the Schlegels almost exclusively based on morphology which aims at the establishment of genetic relationships, the other associated with the name of Wilhelm von Humboldt and others of course, which emphasizes linguistic diversity and classifies languages according to morphological syntactic types. But these two strands have subsequently been combined in various ways by 19th and 20th century successors to the extent that individual ingredients have become hard to ascribe to one or the other. Languages can also be classified by the way they mark grammatical functions. In isolating languages such as Chinese and even more strikingly Vietnamese, words are morphologically unanalyzable, that is, in which each linguistic unit that carries meaning, meaning word are composed of single morphemes, while in synthetic languages they can consist of several morphemes. English is mildly synthetic. It has inflections such as the plural suffix in books, that's why it is analytic, some scholars call, while languages such as Latin have many inflections. Some languages such as Inuktitut spoken by the Inuit are sometimes called polysynthetic because they use very many inflectional affixes and one word in such languages can correspond to an entire sentence in other languages. Synthetic languages can be divided into fusional and agglutinative languages. In agglutinating languages, each morpheme usually has a single function and words can consist of many morphemes. An agglutinative language, for example, Tamil, Kannada, Turkish, is one in which the word forms can be segmented into morphs, each of which represents a single grammatical category. In such a language, words can consist of many morphemes. Turkish is a good example of an agglutinative language. In this language, the word Everlinde means in my houses and consists of the following morphemes. Ev is house, ler plural, im my and they in. In fusional languages, affixes can combine functions in the Spanish word hablo, he spoke, o simultaneously indicates both the past tense and a third person singular subject. An inflecting language is one in which there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between particular word segments and particular grammatical categories. The older Indo-European languages tend to be inflecting in this sense. For example, the Latin suffix is represents the combination of categories singular and genitive. In the word forum, homines of the man, but one part of the suffix cannot be assigned to singular and another to genitive. And is is only one of many suffixes that in different classes or declensions of words represent the combination of singular and genitive. Similarly, in Sanskrit, Ramaha, while the stem is Rama, the suffix her simultaneously marks singular number and nominative case. The Humboldt Schlegel typology attempted in effect to classify languages simultaneously on not just one dimension but several. These dimensions are one, 
the extent to which individual words carry an overt mark of the syntactic function as subject, modifier, etc. And conversely, the extent to which syntactic function is indicated solely by word order. B. The extent to which any overt marking of syntactic function is carried out by individual affixes related in one-to-one -one fashion to the functions in question. The extent to which overt marking of syntactic function is combined with the expression of more concrete or derivational meanings as for exam example in most Indo-European languages where any overt marker of case also marks number or with the expression of lexical meanings as in the English word forums our and us where no marker of possessive or non-subject function is separable from the expression of the lexical meaning of the lexeme V. The extent to which new word forums can be freely created by recursive compounding of lexical material. E. The extent to which nominal arguments of the verb or other nominal or adverbial elements which may or must be incorporated into the word forum. Some of these dimensions are logically connected. For example, dimensions B and C are irrelevant to any language which is at the isolating extreme on dimension A in having no overt marking of syntactic function and dimensions A, D are all irrelevant to a language at the maximally incorporating extreme on dimension E which would be a language in which the word and the sentence D and also on dimension B, C and D are logically independent. Yet the fourfold Humboldtian classification singles out for special labeling just a few of the possible combinations of settings. In particular, an ideal inflecting language was seen as having in effect the following settings minimally isolating B minimal, C maximal, D low and E minimal. But what of a language such as Turkish which differs from this ideal principally in dimensions B and C. Turkish is rich in inflectional morphology in the sense that it makes much use of affixes to express syntactic functions but is an agglutinating language rather than an inflecting one. This reflects the failure on the part of the 19th century typologies to distinguish clearly between dimension A, B and C. On the other hand, a propensity for compounding that is a high setting on dimension D was generally regarded as characteristic of agglutinating languages despite the fact that it is not a salient feature of Turkish but is one of the most salient features of the archetypically inflecting language Sanskrit. An independent problem concerns the extent to which any one language can be located consistently at one point in any of these dimensions. For example, Latin nominal morphology approaches the inflecting ideal by rating low on dimension B and high on C as shown for example in the dative plural forum puellis to the girls where the suffix is is not segmentable into a plural part and a dative part. Contrast for instance Turkish 
chirlera to the girls in which the plural suffix ler and the dative suffix a are clearly separable. On the other hand, many Latin verb forms rate high on dimension b because their affixal material is readily segmentable into individual affixes with individual meanings as in amantur they are loud where ant is the unique expression of third person plural in all latin verb forms and ur transparently expresses passive to this extent therefore latin morphology appears agglutinating rather than inflectional there are two more typologies august Fleischer and Franz Fing mentioned earlier also need to be mentioned for their contributions in this area. Schleicher classified languages into one monosyllabic, two agglutinative and three flexional on the basis of meaning and relation. He said that all languages could be classified by virtue of the manner in which sound is used to express these two concepts. The most complete typology based on grammatical semantic criteria is that of Fink. He assumed eight times, eight types, Turkish standing in one end and English in the other. The eight types are one root isolating, for example, Chinese, B, stem isolating, for example, Samoan or Malay, C, root inflected, for example, Arabic, D, stem inflected, for example, Greek, German, E, group inflected, for example, Georgian, Basque, F, juxtaposing, for example, most Bantu languages, G, subordinating, for example, Turkish, and H, incorporating, for example, Eskimo and most American, Amerindian languages. He used two processes for this classification, wise, analyzing a real situation into its components and restoring it to a whole via the words of language. The definition of word is crucial in his scheme. However, Fink's definition is quite arbitrary. Because of this, the value of his classification becomes reduced. Distinction of C versus D divides the Semitic and Indo-European languages, whereas types C to E may be labeled inflecting languages, types F and H have an agglutinative element in common. Sapir fine-tuned the post-Humboldtian heritage in his book Language, 1921, chapter Types of Linguistic Structure. Culmination of this kind of traditional endeavor can be seen. Sapir not only distinguished between simple and complex few relational and mixed relational classes of languages, but also revived and modified the traditional tripartite division by distinguishing between agglutinative isolating, fusional isolating, and symbolic isolating to add the refinement of the first distinction. Further, he says, should it prove desirable to insist on the degree of elaboration of the word, the term analytic, synthetic, and polysynthetic can be added as descriptive terms. Further, Sapir presents his classification of the different and varying types of morphological organization found in languages from many parts of the world, from Tibet, Africa, Europe, the Near East, Polynesia and North America. Followed by Fink, Sapir employs 
a larger and improved version of typological classification. He proposes uh, a somewhat uh, an enlarged system. In fact, it's called multidimensional typology. He explic explicitly recognized the failure of 19th century typologists in to distinguish different dimensions of classification. He himself distinguished four such dimensions, some semantic or syntactic rather than morphological as follows. Basic, there is concrete concepts, objects, actions, qualities would belong to this one. Second, derivational concepts. Third, concrete relational concepts. And fourth, pure relational concepts. So, considering that the, these are the four types, but it's not necessary that all the four need to be there in each and every language. Group one and four are universal and must be represented in every language, whereas two and three are facultative. Of course, group three is rather obscure, but perhaps we can say that the um in Latin, vidi virum, I saw the man, indicate the relation of man to seeing, that is four, which in English is given by world order. Then the second um in vidi virum bonum, I saw the good man, would seem to, to be three relating bonum to virum. Greenberg in 1954 gives a, an elaborate scheme by suggesting how a language position on each of space dimension can be quantified to yield exact numerical values. Taking samples of 100 words of running text, Greenberg calculated various ratios between elements and relations. Uh, let us look at look here briefly at the profiles of eight languages through ten indices of his reproduced below. The traditional non-quantitative results are on the whole confirmed. So he has taken languages like uh, Sanskrit, Old English, Persian, English, that is modern English, Yakut, Swahili, Annamese, Eskimo. As one can see that the languages are spoken in different parts of the world. And on the futures point of view, he has taken various uh, uh, typological futures and uses them as indices. So on the basis of synthesis, number of morphemes per word, uh, level of agglutination, uh, extent of compounding, extent of derivation, gross inflection, prefixing, suffixing, isolation, pure inflection, concord. Taking these uh, typological indices, he obtains the ratios and on the basis of that, he tries to provide a cumulative one rather than uh, based on just one future because languages are complex lots, complex wholes, uh, they do not belong exclusively to one type only. Therefore, uh, taking various futures uh, gives a better uh, value, better judgment. So the students may refer to the references provided and also of course look at the internet and gain quite a bit from them as this particular field has become very significant particularly with uh, Greenberg's universals, concept of universals has become very important and more like a model for the latest studies. So good luck.